welcome to Agile World Better English. Agile World was created by Sabrina Bruce and Carl Smith to focus on Agile within a global community. We're just one addition to the Agile World family. We have Agile World in French and Spanish, and soon we will have it in Indian dialects too. And so we're everywhere. <laughs> I'm Cynthia Khan founder of GSD Mindset and Agile Consultancy, and my co-host is Steve Mowbray. We're both passionate about Agile. Through this podcast, we plan to share experiences of how others apply Agile principles to become successful, so you too can apply them and be successful in your own life. Steve, what's up? Hey, th thanks, Cynthia. Uh, I'm Steve Mowbray, and welcome to Agile World. So today Yay. we've got a really cool thing that, that we're going that we're going to talk about. Imagine if you played a game for a living, or taught others to play games for a living, and that's kind of where all of this started, which is absolutely brilliant. And he's, he's, I don't even think he's an athlete, or, or maybe I don't I don't know. But you know, imagine he's a math athlete, right? He probably he probably is an athlete. But anyway, I am an athlete, uh, and we can go. talk about that too. I, yes, I'm actually. I it, it, okay, we'll start with. We don't even know your name. This, this is this is Luke. <laughs> yeah. Luke yeah, Coleman. This is we Luke Coleman. Hi. Jumping right <laughs> in, and he's awesome. Uh, who? <laughs> yeah. Who? Um, yeah. If you have to tell people who you are, you're not famous, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So I, I'll give my side agile background. I'm actually a former United States uh, junior pairs figure skating champion, and I was. Uh, pairs. Oh, yeah. And I was on the international team of the United States for a few years. And, <sighs> and I just wrote, it was interesting because a friend of mine in the agile community wrote a topic that said something like, look at all these agile or look at the relationship between all these sports and in the Olympics and agility. And he had only picked sports that were team based sports. <laughs> and I thought that that was tragic because <laughs> what, what I did was I created 10 ways in which actual athletes are agile. Um, and I don't remember them all at the top of my head, but, but I'll give you just a few. If you're an elite athlete, and what I'm, when I say this, I am coming from a perspective of an elite athlete, right? They, when I retired, I was the eighth best <clears throat> skater in pairs in America. So I'm an elite athlete. And so from an elite athlete perspective, Let's let's look at some of the some of the practices. Ah, oh, yeah, I don't need to do that. Um, <laughs> but let's look at some of the practices that are associated with elite athletes and and agility. One is incredible discipline. We do the things that we need to do even when we don't feel like doing them. Like we would be the equivalent of we write our tests when we don't feel like writing tests. We run our security scripting tests where we want to do security system uh, scripting. We recognize that other people giving us feedback is super critical. I spent tens of thousands of dollars on coaches. Uh, so we find people who can help us improve our performance and we hire them and we try to listen to them. Uh, I'll give you a, a, another one. We know that um, life is not a consistent um, expenditure of energy. So believe it or not, one of the areas of which I think the agile community really isn't very well uh, organized is around this notion of sustainable pace. I don't believe in sustainable pace. There's no, there's no evidence that sustainable pace is actually how humans live best. And in fact, from an elite athlete perspective, we never had sustainable pace. <laughs> we, we would train for skating, right? Our competition year was uh, February. That's when the national championships were. So during the summer, we would train new tricks. We would develop choreography. So the training was longer and less intense. But as the competition season started to get ready, we would solidify our routines. And in terms of performance, athletes are all about performance and empiricism. My skating coach would keep track of our practice runs and we knew exactly how well we were doing. And if we were peaking too quickly, he would actually slow down our practices because he would be able to chart when we were likely to peak in competition. And he wouldn't want us to peak before we were at the national championships. So I think every athlete has uh, agility baked in. And I think some of the deeper practices and behaviors of 
of of elite athletes are manifested in in elite athlete or elite agile teams. I think that makes makes a, a lot of sense because performance is key and and the the belief that you're never done. You, there's always room for improvement and tweaks and small tweaks can add up to to really big big results in the in the end. Yeah, and then and then of course the notion of the rhythm is after the national championships were done, we're tired. We're, we're going to, we're going to take a, you know, a break, you know, we took maybe take two weeks off, give our bodies a little chance to heal because by the time you're at that level in, in any sport, you're, you're always dinged up a little in any elite sport. And so you take a little bit of time to heal and then it's not like we stop, right? You do recovery workouts. So, so one of the areas in which I'm known for being a little bit of an iconoclast in the agile community is when people are like, oh, it's got to be sustainable pace. It's got to be sustainable pace. And I'm like, yeah, not so much. <laughs> well, not sustainable so much. pace may, may be over, over the long haul, right? So sometimes- Well, it's a time horizon of what sustainable is. Yeah. I, think, I, don't know, I think they confuse sustainable pace with predictability because you still need to kind of try to, you, you're trying to figure out, I have a fixed time, fixed team. When do you think I get it done? Even if you rush, even if no matter how your sprints are going or whatever, how, whatever you're practicing, it's really, people want you to walk your talk, right? That's, that's the, the point. So I think people, I think that's a confusion of, and a misinterpretation of the concept of. It could be. Yeah. I, 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 very well. I mean, that's a very, that's, that's insightful uh, in terms of where it comes from. Okay, so so somewhere okay. along <laughs> that's not, by the way, so this, this is beautiful. This is not the listeners. topic. By for all the people who are listening, that's not what we intended to talk about. But hey, you well, started with that conversation, so I was going to take. I it. wanted to know. I wanted to know, and I'm thrilled to know. I did not know that about you, Luke. So so that is wonderful. And somewhere along the line, you went from elite skater to elite coach and transformation agent helping <laughs> helping people play nice together through games tell yes. me about that how did, how did that happen what was that moment like what did that drink because that's brilliant well uh innovation games were an outcome of a, a <clears throat> bunch of work i had done at university on cognitive psychology and organizational behavior so my first book was in 1996 uh journey of the software professional which is a deep treatment of cognitive psychology and organizational behavior and how humans really interact. Uh, for agile people, one of the highest compliments I got about the book, I remember one time Alistair Coburn said, if you wanna know how to do agile, read the methods. If you wanna know the deeper, deeper, deeper principles of how agile works, read Journey of the Software Professional. Sweet, um, Whoa, okay. which is pretty nice. Um, from there, we, what we uh, learned is, there, there are certain patterns of human behavior, there's certain patterns of human thinking, and we can create certain contexts to promote certain outcomes. So if I want divergent thinking, I can create a structure and an interaction model that allows me to create divergent thinking. If I want sense making, or if I want convergent thinking, if I want retrospection, and it turns out that uh, games and game theory, I uh, map cleanly into that world. So if you look at a game and how a game is defined, a game is going to have a goal, something to achieve. It's going to have a set of resources by which I achieve the goal. It's going to have a method of keeping score or keeping feedback. It's going to have rules for how we interact with each other, how we interact with the resources. And it's going to have a set of um, uh, uh, interaction models that allows us to determine whether or not that result was worth keeping. Now, what the, the biggest difference between a, a entertaining game and a serious game is that the outcome of the game in an entertainment game is, it doesn't mean anything. But in a serious game, the outcome is serious, it matters. Uh, the other aspect of- You've never game played theory, games with me before, it always matters. Yeah, it always matters. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and they're, in many ways they're more fun when they do. Uh, but there's one other quality about a true game that is very wonderful for the Agile community, and that is voluntary participation, right? It, uh, I stand on this side of the line. I can do anything I want with the ball. I move across the line, and I agree not to touch it with my hands unless I'm the goalkeeper. 
uh, I have a white ball in my hand and any rational person could just walk up and drop it in the hole. But the moment I step onto a, a, a piece of grass that I paid a lot of money to step onto, I've decided that the only way I can hit it into the hole is whack it with a stick. Um, <laughs> and that so, hole is 300 yards away. And it's 300 <laughs> yards away, right? Um, and the reason we play games is they're fun, right? We, we play games while they're, 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 they're engaging. And so innovation games are a collection of serious games that are, were originally designed to engage in market research, have been since adapted and extended into a wide variety of applications, which is great because we change the rules of games all the time. When did cricket become baseball? When did rugby become football, American football? Uh, so we change the game rules all the time. Uh, and that's how we evolve. That's how we improve uh, games because we look at the evolution and we look at the outcome and we look at the process and we say, wow, that felt better. Let's, let's keep that. Okay, so there's always this constant state of improvement. And by the way, this, is, this, this podcast is Agile News Better English because Carl and Sabrina Bruce, they were born on across the pond in another little, another little strip of land where they speak English, but, it's, but we have the better English. So they, they speak English actually. with a better <laughs> accent than we no, do. No, we have a better accent. Yeah. Are, they, well, they, they, are we think, they, our Americans think they do. I yeah, don't they, yeah, we do. Hey, <laughs> Carl was the one that named it. So he's the one that yeah. told us we have better, better English. So this is brilliant. And you, you mentioned divergent thinking. Yes. So, so this was a way to help, help bring out divergent thinking in teams. Why is divergent thinking important? Well, it is one form of thinking that's important. I think that What's, what's even more important than thinking is the meta thinking, right? Uh, because I like to go to Broadway when I talk agile, right? Anything you can do, I can do meta. Um, and so the- uh, You can sing I can do too. meta better than you, right? Hey, so we're singing skate, and, and podcasting and Englishing. But the, the point is, is what is the objective that I'm facing? And is the objective that I'm facing one that would benefit from divergent thinking? Well, from that perspective, if what I seek is divergence, then I should probably choose a technique that promotes divergence. Can you However, give an not example every... of that, please? Uh, an example? Sure. I mean, because I think I'm having a hard time with it myself. And if I'm doing it, then maybe somebody else is. Because I mean, I know what divergent thinking is and the game, but like describe a game that would do right. That. How about I? How about I do the the opposite, and then we can use it as contrast. So okay, cool. let's use convergent thinking. One of the convergent thinking uh, innovation games is called buy a feature. I have a list of features. They all have a price. I have a a, a sum of a, a budget, and I give each player an equal sum of the budget. So if my budget is twenty million dollars, and I have five players, each player gets four million dollars, and they collaboratively buy the features they want. So if one feature is 2 million, you can solo purchase it. If one feature is 6 million, you actually have to get people to join you, right? So okay. it's a collaborative activity. Now, by definition, that is a convergent thinking because the set of items is fixed coming into the, to the forum okay. and the a budget is fixed. And I'm trying to figure out what you want, which is, um, an N set selector over a set of items. I want to figure out what are the what are the N items out of the M set that the group wants. And you can see how that's convergent. Now let's talk about divergent. Well, divergent typically is manifested by more than one idea. And I don't know what ideas are going to be created. So a well-known activity in the Agile community is speedboat. And it's often applied as a retrospective technique or sailboat. I imagine that my process is a boat, uh, a sailboat, and wind makes it go faster and anchors slow it down. So what are the anchors and what are the wind? And we add some uh, richness to the metaphor. We say the lower the anchor, the worse it is, the, the stronger the wind, the better it is. And we analyze those results. A properly constructed speedboat retrospective does not have any a priori items. The facilitator will simply hand out uh, post-its, physical or virtual, depending on the tool that you're using, and let you create them. So by definition, I, I don't know what I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get some number of items. 
I don't know if those items are any good or not. Maybe I don't get anything that's actionable. Maybe I get some great stuff, but that's the notion of a divergent process. I, I don't know what I'm going to get when I start. Does that help uh, frame them uh, uh, differently? So one is a fixed set of outcomes or a fixed, you're playing within fixed parameters. The other one is, is you're making up the parameters and some of those parameters are going to be judged as good or helping you go faster. Some of those are going to be judged as not as good and slow you down. And that, and the team and the game is to figure out based on whatever it is that you're discussing, what's going to help you and what's going to hurt you. Yeah. yeah. That's, an ex- if, that's a great yeah. way to decide that. Yeah, yeah Thank absolutely. You. Great, very, very good. good. Very good. Absolutely. And if, if I may, <laughs> if I may sum it up, because I, I've had to sum it up multiple times is when you're brainstorming (laughs) is when you're brainstorming you want to get as many ideas as possible right you want to just let it let it flow and you want to have divergent you don't want everybody to have the same thing right so you want divergent thoughts but eventually you get to a point to where you need to weed through them and you need to come up with a solution or two or three things that you can move forward with and that's when you want to have the convergence so you 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 often go through this process of divergent thinking when you're trying to come up with new ideas and then convergent thinking when you're trying to put those ideas into into play which is perfect for retrospective because that's what yes. you're trying to do it's one of the it's one of the design kinds thinking of, and of retrospective, all kinds of uh, retrospectives design yeah. thinking absolutely the the one thing that i would add to that steve and and this is um quite consistent with my work uh over mm-hmm. the years is Simply handing people post-its and notes and saying, be creative is, is actually rather hard. I'm a yeah. huge fan of uh, linguistic, and, uh, and linguistic analysis and metaphorical structures and metaphorical thinking. So you'll see that a lot in the activities I do. We use speedboat or sailboat as a metaphor. We use mm-hmm. prune the product tree to be the <laughs> metaphor for growth or prune the future. So I use a lot of... Uh, rich metaphors to design these activities. Uh, And when I'm teaching game design, I teach a masterclass every now and then on how to design games. One of the techniques of game design is to leverage a metaphor and then see what, how that metaphor informs the actual um, game structure and game interaction model. That is beautiful. I'd love to learn more about one of those, those master classes. (laughs) Um, So we'll, we'll come, we'll come back to that. So, all right. So you've gone through, this process of innovation games and there's a book called innovation games and there's there's a number of you know games in there each with you know a particular purpose to help solve things it's beautiful uh, you used you used to do workshops on those i don't know if you still do i i don't do too many workshops on those anymore i have colleagues if if anyone needs those uh, this isn't a, 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 this isn't a sales call but if, if people need workshops or or innovation games facilitators There's a wide diaspora of friendships that I created in the Agile community, and there's many people who are highly skilled at this, and I'd be happy to connect you up. Okay, I'd say that um, I'm a very, in a sense, passionately committed person to something that I undertake. So what happened is in the creation of the book, innovation games, one of the games by a feature started to be adopted in the portfolio management community because it was a great way to internally allocate budgets and resources against internal project portfolios or internal uh, product portfolios or internal initiatives. Okay. Por- so, portfolio bu- bu- budgeting. What, what, what portfolio what budgeting. By- um, what, what's the game and describe that a little bit. So, so again, it was by a feature. So there's a, there, in, in buy a feature oh, for buy. Product, buy I, I was thinking like buy a, like bio feature, like buy no, not, not a bio, feature. Not B-I-O, B-U-Y, buy, buy purchase a feature. Purchase a feature or oh, fund good. a feature. So, so that, that's how you can prioritize. In yeah, the, what in features an would you product? fund yeah. with mm-hmm. money if you had money? And, and we often framed it with customers as here's our budget. How do you want to spend our research budget? And they would make the investments that were appropriate. Well, what happened is the companies that started to adopt innovation games for customer interactions started using it for prioritizing initiatives in portfolio management. Exact same structure. I've got a list of initiatives that I could fund. And always I have more initiatives than I can fund. 
Of course. Right. Ask, ask, ask a product manager if they don't have more features in the backlog than what their team can get done. I mean, it's, or yeah, ask a marketing person, do you have more marketing programs than what you can afford that you would like to do? I mean, it's the same everywhere. So you always have this notion of prioritization of initiatives. And so uh, as applied to portfolio management, it's the same structure, except the players are internal employees. Mm -hmm. The money represents the actual budget of the portfolio and the items are the initiatives, same structure. And we started doing that internally. It became successful enough that we built a software company around it. We then uh, shared this with the Agile community and Dean Leffingwell of the Scaled Agile Framework got really excited about what it could do. And we started to bring it into the Scaled Agile Framework at the portfolio management layer. Um, not every Agile method deals with uh, portfolios. Mm -hmm. Some do, some don't. Uh, SAFE is uniquely suited uh, towards large scale uh, Agile development or uh, scaling agile development, because eventually you do have to make portfolio decisions. You actually have to decide from an economic standpoint, I've got four product. Do I, do I fund them equally? Is one growing faster? Should I fund it more? How, what about my initiate? What about my innovation portfolio and my innovation pipeline as a, at a portfolio level of a company, am I allocating some of my money to experiments that may or may not work out? These are not questions of a given product manager. These are questions of a portfolio that's managing a portfolio of investments, just like you are managing a portfolio of investments in your personal life. You, uh, the Tesla people would say, put every dime you have in Tesla. Most of us are not quite that well uh, off. And so we might have our investments in a few places. <laughs> Right. right. We might but want I, to invest in, in our vacations. We might want to invest in a new car, new clothes, dinners, dates, whatever. Yeah. That's, yeah. Absolutely. I, absolutely. I, I would sense. say that it's not just for large scale because I consult mostly to smaller companies and startups and they have to make some decisions. I think the number one reason that people run out of runway is because they don't understand the concept of minimum viable product. And I think that your game or maybe a scaled down version of the game would be very helpful because product yeah. manage, people don't understand a lot of the things that we take for granted as agilists, other people don't, don't know. Right. Well, you're hundred percent correct. And I would say that every organization regardless of size, has a prioritization process. It could be a small company with a CEO who is dominant and he or she says, uh, this is what we're going to do. Uh, larger companies have more people involved, but you're, you're correct. It doesn't matter if you're big or small, you have a prioritization uh, process. And if you can state it, then you can understand it, you can improve it, you can analyze its results, look at its performance, so rolling the clock forward, we had built a software platform. Uh, and this is where I kind of left a little bit of the agile in the small community. And our clients started to become people like Salesforce and eBay and Cisco and United Technologies and NASPERS and BMW and Daimler. And we ended up helping those organizations manage more than $3 billion in portfolio investments. And uh, that number is so much larger than what agile teams normally work with that they can't even count the number of zeros. And that, that sounds a little uh, uh, snarky, but what I'm trying to illustrate is that when agile people get too focused on agile in the small, they limit the possibility and benefit of agile itself. And that's really powerful. So along the way of doing a company, I started doing participatory budgeting in cities philanthropically, helping cities engage with citizens to manage uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of city spending. And then I started doing it in schools to look at what would happen when students were given real money and trusted to make and manage that, uh, make investment decisions or make spending decisions in their school. And that's when I got really hooked on that process. It came to pass that I 
ended up selling Contenio to Scaled Agile and that project and that, that work has been integrated. And now Scaled Agile has a, a software platform called Safe Collaborate. It's really wonderful and it's doing great. Uh, and then I left Scaled Agile last year to start First Root, which is a company that uses participatory budgeting techniques in schools to promote civic engagement and financial literacy. And my motivations are twofold. First is uh, civic engagement has uh, plummeted in uh, Western democracies around the world. And we have become polarized. We no longer uh, communicate to each other effectively. And it's really frightening. Tufts University reports that 24% of millennials now think democracy is a bad way to run the country. And I don't even want to get into, I'm not, let's not go with that all the way down that rat hole, but I, we, I agree that that, that that statement is enough to make me cry. Right, and so you want to cry, but I, I think that, be careful though, because Cynthia, I would say that when people say, I don't want to talk about politics, to me, that's like, okay, that's exactly the problem. We've lost our ability to have a productive conversation about our political process and political system. I really don't care if you're Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or Tea Party. I care, are you an engaged citizen who is willing to listen to the uh, discussions that are that are presented, the arguments that are presented, and can we find a path forward in making choices? And if we don't start teaching our children this, we're not going to create adults who are capable of living in a civil society. So one of the big drivers of uh, First Root is we know that participatory budgeting in schools creates a more civil uh, student who becomes a more uh, engaged uh, member of society. There's research that supports that assertion from Arizona State University. Wow. Uh, the second thing is financial literacy, right? We are 50, <laughs> 80 years ago, we had a much simpler financial system and we didn't need as, I mean, credit cards weren't even created until the mid fifties, right? And they were very simple. Now the complexity of our modern world has motivated us to outstrip what even parents can teach their children beyond the basics of budgeting. And what we find in our process is because students are put in control, youth is in control of the process, they learn through learning by doing, which is the most effective way to learn, how to manage the budget associated with the program. And it's really remarkable what the kids pick. It's, it's heartwarming, it's inspiring, and uh, it's amazing. So First Root is a a corporation that's designed to change two really fundamental negative trends. One is lack of civic engagement, and the second is uh, financial inequality. Okay, now this is this is this is amazing. I, I think it's fabulous. And and if 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 I can find kind of follow it through in my own head, so we started off with this concept of buy a feature, which is somewhat of a smaller scale. You give people fake fake money, monopoly. Yeah, for market research, yep. smaller scale. You guys can buy all this. And everybody has to collaborate and work work together to some extent. And there might be some bullies there, but there might be some good collaborators and go for it. Then that got involved. Then that moved to, to corporations realizing how brilliant this is. So the, the C-suite or those that own the companies or really need to set the direction can start getting these things in play. And the conversations have to come together and in the open, as opposed to a lot of backroom conversations for a lot of financing which I think is a huge thing because now we have to, we, we have to work together to some extent. And then you've taken this and now you've applied it to people, citizens of, of cities, states, right? And now it's going to schools. So we have students, if I understand this correctly, you got students sitting down, taking real money, real and, money and helping decide where that's going to be spent. Now, how many students are involved with this? What does that look like? Well, it's pretty That's profound. Funny. And I want to make a distinction here. Uh, I'm going to give some examples. I don't want to imply that these um, school districts are customers of ours, although we're in conversations with all of them. Uh, but New York City is one of the nation's largest school districts. 1,800 schools, 1.1 million students. New York City has created a civics curriculum 
specifically highlighting and based on participatory budgeting. You can go to the New York City Department of Education, look at the Civics for All curriculum. It's based on participatory budgeting. And the Mayor de Blasio of New York City has allocated $2,000 for 400 high schools in New York City for participatory budgeting. In Chicago, uh, the Chicago public school system, they have a civics curriculum based on participatory budgeting. And this year they have allocated $10,000 to 30 high schools. Phoenix Union, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, the Phoenix Union High School District has uh, canceled their school resource officer. And a school resource officer is a euphemism for a police officer in a school. And the data shows that if you put police in schools, you push the problem to the edge of the school where it's often worse than, than dealing mm -hmm. with the tensions within the school. They canceled their contract for school resource uh, school resource officers, and they've allocated $1.2 million to participatory budgeting programs in Phoenix high schools uh, uh, thematically associated with school safety. We're seeing participatory budgeting, not just in the US, it actually started in Brazil. And we see PB in schools around the world and in governments around the world. It's endorsed and supported by the United Nations as a means to promote civic engagement and fight corruption. And as Bono says in one of his TED Talks, which I love is, transparency is the vaccine for corruption. So oh, that, that's a brilliant statement. And you mentioned that, Steve, you know, how many times have, have we worked in large organizations where we don't know how the portfolio decisions were made? And we know that there's backdoor dealings, but, you know, we don't know how they're made and it's frustrating. When you are engaging in participatory budgeting, you are making a commitment to a certain form of transparency and inclusion uh, that's often lacking. So you're sitting there talking to the, to the people Face to face, right? People or online, have, depending if or, we're zooming, okay, yeah, you know, good, or, or good you know, remote. Good point. I can, yeah. Isn't yeah. that terrible? I'm sorry to consider this face to face. So, <laughs> so, but but you're there with the people that are that may want something other than you, and you start having these conversations, and at the end of it, maybe you got your way, maybe you didn't, but at least you had the opportunity to discuss it and understand and hopefully understand someone else's point of view. So instead of just, this is the, this is the result and you're stuck with it and you gotta live with it, what happened, right? So brilliant, and, brilliant idea. And brilliant here's concepts. the bonus for all the listeners. Our platform is free for families. Mm -hmm. So I have four kids and we use participatory budgeting in our family on a couple of different occasions. When we're planning our family vacation, we bring the kids into that conversation. They're young adults, they have a right to be involved. When we're looking at our charitable donations, we bring the kids in. And when we're looking at making improvements to our home, we also bring the kids into that kind of conversation. It gives my wife and I an opportunity to talk about really important financial concepts. Like it's maybe okay to take a loan for a home improvement, but it's probably not okay to take a loan for a family vacation. It gives us a chance to, to illustrate total cost of ownership. When the kids say, I wanna to go to Disney and mom and dad say, no, it's too expensive. They're thinking of the tickets and mom and dad are thinking of the tickets and the food and the parking and mm -hmm. the inevitable uh, souvenir. And so the kids go on the website and say, mom and dad, it's only you know 70 bucks a person. And we're thinking, actually, total cost of ownership is more like 200 a person when you add in all that other stuff. It's way more okay. than that, baby. Oh, yeah. way more than that, right? <laughs> I haven't been to Disney in a few years. And then it also gives us the chance to talk about what adults say are operating versus capital expenses. Uh, it, there's a very, like in home improvement, there's a very different home improvement of uh replacing my windows, which may be old and I need to replace, and that's a capital expense, versus putting in a, a brand new uh, lawn that it also requires me to, to maintain it differently than I have in the past, and it could increase my water expense. Or it could be decreasing, it could be a capital expense yeah. investment that decreases an operational expense. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, and, and having those kinds of conversations with the kids, give them insight into strategies of money management and strategies of wealth creation that uh, are there for our families. And this gives us an opportunity to have that discussion. So our, our platform at First Root is free for families. It's designed to be free for families to help promote financial literacy. Okay, well, so for, first, first root. How how do how do we get to first root? Uh, www.firstroot.co. And I'm a pretty a, a pretty open and available guy in the uh, in <laughs> social media. If people can't find me, they're not trying. <laughs> this is true. This is true. So people can find you pretty pretty much anywhere: LinkedIn, Facebook. LinkedIn, Twitter. Facebook. Uh, I try not to use Facebook too much because uh, of, of the deleterious effects we know of social okay. media. But, but firstroot.co. Um, firstroot.co, first root, first LinkedIn, and uh, of course, this podcast. And, and um, they know how to get a hold of you and you know how to get a hold of me. So <laughs> Okay. All right. And how, how, would, how would you respond to somebody reaching out to you and say, Luke, I need some information. I want to get this into my school. Would you like talk to them? I'd be honored to talk to them. <laughs> I know, of course. I know that, that's what, that's why I mentioned it. Is. <laughs> yeah, of course. And so you knew that answer, but thank you for giving me a slow pitch across the plate um, uh, to hit. But of course, and of course, we have a lot of materials on firstroot.co to help you bring it into schools. There's guides, there's teacher FAQs, there's mechanisms by which you can engage the community. Uh, there's all sorts of ways. And I, I, I'm excited to be here and I'm thankful to be here because I envision the, I've always felt that if all we're doing in the Agile community is building better software, then I want to find a different community. Absolutely. I want to make a better world. I just think that Agile practices and principles do make a better world when, when we leverage them in a number of ways. So I believe that, uh, I, and I don't really care what tribe of Agile you're from. I'm from the safe tribe, but there are other valid tribes out there. Um, and, and, and I celebrate my friendships with all these other tribes because I want all of the agilists around the world to be engaged in these kind of collaborative and participating, uh, participatory techniques. Well, the fact that you can use the same concept with your family to plan your vacations, you know, I, I I'm thinking the next, the next time we decide to eat out or, or, or do do carry out i'm gonna try i'm gonna try it or give it a spin it, you'll be I'm a surprise give, give it a shot with the happens. family and see see how, <laughs> see how it goes because i've done this with organizations before but now i'm going to try it with with the family and see how that goes <laughs> anyway this is brilliant this is brilliant. i love this i love this and I, I i found out some new things about you luke even though i've followed your career to some extent part of part of it at least um, I've, I've learned a great deal about you and a great deal about how these agile principles and participatory budgeting can be applied to the whole world to make the world a better place and hopefully get people coming up with better solutions and working together. Okay. Thank you. Uh, awesome. I, thank you so much. Cynthia. Yes, Steve. Well, we're, we're getting close to close to about time. Yeah, I think so. Well, for those of you who are watching this on a video, we'd like to let you know that we're on all the social media sites, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and even Tumblr. If you're still there, we're there. <laughs> the video is on YouTube as well as on our agile-world.news website. And was it today? We, we just hit over 2000 subscribers. So I think we need to have a little celebratory. Raise the roof. That's awesome. We That's, yeah, we we're so excited. And the podcast themselves, if you're walking around, going places, doing things and just want to listen, Spotify, Apple, Google, Pocket Cast, Anchor, Breaker and Radio Public. If you have any ideas or you want to be a guest on our Agile World Better English show, you can email me at Cynthia at Agile-World.News or Steve at agile-world.news. I'm getting better at that. That is a tongue twister. Don't try to say that 10 times. <laughs> and, and you don't have to be an elite athlete to come on board. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk, talk we'll to, talk to you even if you're so. just an average Joe. <laughs> so 
So Luke, I, this, this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you listening, reach out to Luke. He's really a wonderful guy. Um, and we can all learn so much from what he's, he's done. And this is just su such a great journey. It's such an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you Bye. so much for having Thank me. Thank you guys. Bye everyone. Bye.